Hello and welcome to lecture number 38. This lecture will cover an introduction to bipolar disorder and introduction to treating bipolar disorder. In particular, the drug we'll focus on at the end of this lecture is a drug called lithium. And that uh, is long been sort of the standard against which other treatments are compared. And we'll talk about why it's effective in some cases, why it's not effective, and focus a, a little bit of time on its toxicity. It's not for everyone, and it has to be carefully monitored. So please keep that in mind. So we'll start with a background on bipolar disorder. There are different classifications of bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar 1 is when at least a person has had at least one episode of mania. Um, generally, uh, and we'll get into some more details about this, most people have had more than one episode. A bipolar 2 has had, an individual has had a, a major depressive episode and hypomanic episodes. Cyclothmia is um, sort of less severe mood swings, less severe mania, so hypomania, uh, and less severe depression, but still can be um, very uh, difficult to live with. Bipolar not otherwise specified generally includes only hypomanias. I do want to spend a little bit of time looking at the um, DSM-4 versus 5. So you can see in the DSM-4, uh, one or more manic or mixed episodes, uh, bipolar 2, one or more depressive episodes, and one or more hypomanic episodes. Cyclothmia, numerous periods of hypomanic systems and depressive, depressive symptoms with no symptom-free periods for longer than two months at a time. Um, and then NOS is it just doesn't fall into other categories. Um, so some specific individual parts of this are uh, for mixed episodes, symptoms are replaced with sort of mixed feature specifiers. And I encourage you to look at the DSM-5, which is available online uh, if you're interested. So some symptoms of mania, and this is the part that's sometimes difficult to understand. Depression, most people get, and obviously we've covered that in previous, episodes, previous lectures. Uh, but manic episodes are uh, sort of long periods of feeling high or overly happy. They can also be extremely irritable, generally up lo uh, long periods of time, uh, talking fast, jumping from one idea to another, having racing thoughts, being easily distracted. Um, tend to increase their activities, such as taking on a lot of new projects. I'm going to take on this, I'm going to take on that, I'm going to take on this. But then, of course, can't get to all of them. They sleep little, or they're not very tired, and oftentimes a very high sex drive. And so uh, this is uh, sort of a typical uh, symptoms of a manic episode. Now, the problem is sometimes people like that kind of feeling, and so they don't want to get treated because they miss that period of activity. But the problem is, is it, f it can be followed by a severe crash. So that irritability. Uh, another uh, issue is excessive high-risk activities, oftentimes including drug use or high-risk sex, uh, other high-risk activities. Uh, generally inflated self-esteem, so we think we can get a lot done. Man, I'm going to get all this stuff done, I'm going to get on these projects. And I've, I think many of us um, have had some now, at least mild periods like this, um, and I know a lot of people who uh, have uh, turned out to have a bipolar disorder, and you know you do get that kind of. Uh, I really feel I can get all these things done, and you take on too much, uh, and then that can come crashing down around you. This kind of flight of ideas, where you get things that kind of fly through your head and then kind of go on. Distractibility certainly. Decreased need for sleep. All of these are symptoms of mania, and so they're something to watch out for. In terms of the epidemiology of bipolar disorder, the prevalence is about 1% of overall populations. Um, bipolar disorder 1, um, generally equal numbers of males and females. For bipolar disorder 2, more females than males. Um, Age of onset is variable. The first symptoms tend to be around 15 to 19, and we'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, there is, however, a really long delay before correct diagnosis and treatment. Bipolar disorder is one of the uh, most poorly diagnosed and underdiagnosed uh, of the disorders we've talked about, and so that's an important thing to keep in mind. It can have a very high mortality rate. About 25 to 50 percent of people with bipolar disorder will attempt suicide and around 19% will succeed. 
So we really want to make sure that people are getting adequately treated. The risk of developing bipolar disorder is about a half to 1%. The incidence of new cases per year is about 0.01% for men and 0.01 to 0.03% for women. So very low uh, prevalence, but um, we have to still uh, make sure that people who have the dis disorder are getting treated appropriately. And I think that may be actually, those rates may be low. Um, Unipolar mania occurs in about 1% of the population of bipolar patients, so they don't experience any of the depressive episodes, but still can be very disruptive. Onset is usually by the third decade, and by that, what I want to say is by the third decade is when this is usually diagnosed um, or becomes very clear. There's a number of people in my life that I am quite convinced, um, based on their cognitive behavior, uh, probably should be diagnosed. Um, and I think it's something to keep in mind when trying to help work with and manage people who have this disorder. Try to get them, encourage them to get into treatment, um, but certainly it's something to watch out for. So this is the important, one of the important graphs I really want to um, highlight is the age of symptom onset can be um, in adolescence, and you can see there's a pretty significant number of symptoms that are occurring uh, in the 10 to 19 year, or even 5 to 19 year range, um, or people with symptoms. And if we can get these individuals into treatment, we may be able to really uh, help them lead much more productive lives, because the lag to diagnosis tends to be around 8 years after these symptoms. So that's the next thing I want to talk about is some of these clinical issues. I'm having a little difficulty with this. So most patients seek treatment for depression. There's a significant delay between onset of symptoms, correct diagnosis, and treatment. The bipolar spectrum disorders generally have a stable course over time, so they tend to sort of wax and wane in the same kind of um, rate for individuals. Suicide rates, as I said before, are very high in bipolar disorder, and so you want to really watch out for that. Uh, only 20% of patients who screen positive for bipolar disorder receive the diagnosis. So this is a grossly underdiagnosed uh, disorder. 31% uh, receive diagnosis of unipolar depression, and 49% receive no diagnosis at all. And so that's really something we want to be mindful of, is we need to get people who uh, have this disorder to be diagnosed appropriately uh, by an appropriate clinician. And the problem is that most family physicians aren't familiar enough with bipolar disorder uh, to diagnose it appropriately, and really a psychologist, clinical psychologist or psychiatrist, uh, should be involved in this diagnosis. Of those who are diagnosed correctly, most were not treated adequately. So they might have received an antidepressant without a mood stabilizer, and that's not not going to work well for a bipolar disorder patient, and we'll talk more about that when we get into talking about how this disorder is treated. So a couple of things to keep in mind. Uh, it's really difficult uh, to differentially diagnose this particular disorder. There are no diagnostic lab tests. Um, there are some uh, potential functional magnetic resonance imaging scans on the horizon which may be able to discern bipolar disorder from uh, major depressive disorder. But bipolar depression does resemble both major depression and schizophrenia. It can resemble antisocial behavior disorders. And in children, in particular, it can uh, mimic ADHD and conduct disorders in children. And the important part about that is the treatments for these disorders are much, uh, much, much different from how you would treat bipolar disorder. And so uh, that's where I think we need to be very mindful about diagnosis of this particular disease. Um, there are substance-induced disorders as well uh, that can uh, resemble bipolar depression. Uh, in fact, uh, cocaine use often can mimic bipolar disorder uh, in some instances, not need to sleep, lots of fleeting of thoughts, um, and then followed by kind of a crash for a few days of depression. Bipolar disorder is not a cycling from one day to the next, but generally weeks and months to weeks and months. So please keep that in mind. And there are some medical conditions as well. The classes of drugs we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk in this lecture about lithium. In the next lecture, we'll talk about uh, anticonvulsant mood stabilizers, 
uh, atypical antipsychotics, and we'll spend a little bit of time talking about omega-3 fatty acids as a uh, potential um, for helping with this particular disorder. So I think that's uh, a good summary of the different classes we'll talk about. Uh, in this lecture, again, we'll talk about lithium, and the rest of these I'll talk about in the next lecture. So treatment for this particular disorder is very critical. Um, an individual can lose up to nine years of life from this disorder, about 14 years of effective activity, uh, 12 years of normal health, 20 to 25 percent of untreated patients will attempt suicide, and 60 percent have comorbid substance abuse disorder. And so this is uh, a really critical disorder to get treated because it does dramatically impact quality of life, health, and even uh, the uh, length with somebody will live. And only about a third of individuals with this disorder are in active treatment. So here are the drugs used in this class. Um, you can see lithium sort of at the top here. It's the sort of original in this class, and it's kind of the standard by which other drugs are compared because of its efficacy. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for everyone, and it has some really dramatic side effects, and so it's not for everyone. Uh, but you can see for acute bipolar depression, uh, mood stabilizer, and acute mania and mixed, it works very well. Uh, valproic acid or Depakote, does generally well. Uh, carbamazepine does generally well. Uh, if you look down the list, olanzapine, uh, risperidone, uh, quidiapine uh, are the uh, drugs with a pretty good efficacy in treating all of the parts of this particular disorder. And we'll talk about the rest of those drugs uh, in the next lecture. We're going to talk about lithium here. So here are the updated clinical practice guidelines from the American Psychiatric Association. For less severe manic episodes, the first-line treatment is monotherapy with uh, lithium, valproate, or um, a second-generation antipsychotic. Uh, which of those depends on the individual, their tolerance, um, etc. Those are the first-line treatments. For, the, for a mixed episode, uh, it's the same as above, but we take lithium out of that because it's less. For severe episodes, usually a combination of either lithium and valproate and an antipsychotic. So uh, two drugs usually used in combination for that. For rapid cycling uh, bipolar disorder, this is the most difficult to treat. Um, and it's relatively rare. Most people cycle over weeks, uh, certainly days and weeks, not from one day to the other, but there are rapid cycling uh, individuals. Um, Lithium and anticonvulsants have pretty low efficacies for this group. The atypical antipsychotics appear promising, particularly olanzapine, uh, uh, appears to be equally effective to some of the anticonvulsants during acute treatment. So we'll take a look at those in the next lecture. So when we talk about treating this disorder, we're usually talking about what we call a mood stabilizer. We're trying to stabilize somebody's mood so it doesn't cycle so rapidly. Um, they may have some neurobiological actions in common with antidepressants. Uh, there's growing evidence of similarities between the damaging effects of depression and bipolar disorder in the brain, and we talked about that in previous lectures. Uh, the goal here may be to reverse some of the impairments in brain structure and levels of uh, BDNF, which we talked about previously. So some of the interventions we talked about, exercise, uh, diet, increases in omega-3 fatty acids, um, those may be effective in at least helping out uh, along the way. Uh, Obviously, this disorder is a little more severe. Depression is very severe as well, of course. Um, but anything we can do to um, sort of help people along, uh, I'm, I'm all for. So uh, lithium valproate and carbamazepine interact with various enzymes involved in signaling pathways, particularly glutamate neural transmission in the hippocampus. And again, that's the area we talked about previously when we talked about antidepressants as being an important part of trying to fix that damage to the hippocampus in the prefrontal cortex. So I want to talk about a couple of um, nationwide studies uh, conducted by uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health. Uh, the first is the Systematic Treatment Enhancement Program for Bipolar Disorder, or the STEP Bipolar Disorder Study. Uh, the first thing is antidepressants added to mood stabilizers are no more effective than placebo for treatment of bipolar disorder. So an individual with bipolar disorder, uh, adding an antidepressant is probably not uh, something we want to do. Uh, 
They did not induce mania more frequently than placebo, which is a concern uh, when added to a mood stabilizer, but they're not doing any good, so there's no reason to take them. Lamotrigine showed benefit for treatment-resistant bipolar depression, and so that may be uh, a drug worth uh, investigating, and again, talking with your doctor about. Uh, and intensive psychosocial treatments showed positive results. In this particular disorder, psychosocial treatments are really important uh, because oftentimes they involve getting family members, friends involved, making sure the individual is staying on their medication, um, really getting a team together to help keep the person um, uh, working uh, towards their treatment goals, uh, et cetera. And so those kind of treatments really show positive results, and I'm all for it. So the last section uh, of this particular lecture is going to be on lithium. We'll first talk about what it is, its history of use, its pharmaco the pharmacokinetics, its pharmacodynamics, uh, spend some time talking about its side effects and toxicity, and then finish up with issues in lithium treatment. Uh, so first, uh, if we look at the uh, reduction in preventing self-harm, lithium is very effective at that. So the rate of cumulative self-harm is dramatically reduced for lithium compared to valproate, alonzapine, or quidiapine, which is a uh, second generation antipsychotic. So if we look at uh, lithium, it really is effective in reducing self-harm. So oftentimes we compare... Uh, other drugs to the efficacy of lithium. So what is it? Well, historically, it's the drug of first choice for treating bipolar disorder. It's the lightest of all alkali metals. It has no psychological effects in healthy people. So if you give, give it to somebody who does not have bipolar disorder, it will have no effect. Um, it's effective in treating about 60 to 80% of acute manic and hypomanic episodes. So that works quite well. Uh, as I said, this is generally the gold standard. Unfortunately, it's also very difficult for people to maintain. Um, so the issues with toxicity and compliance require us to find alternative treatments. It is potentially toxic. You have to have regular uh, lab work done to make sure that your lithium levels are within a specified range. Um, and also, the compliance with taking this drug is oftentimes uh, an issue. So lithium chloride was first introduced as a salt substitute in the late 1940s. Uh, its severe toxicity limited its use. In the 1970s, it was determined that this was effective in treating the mania associated with bipolar disorder. Um, many, many controlled studies demonstrate its efficacy in treating mania and depressive episodes in bipolar disorder. And so it, it has been clearly demonstrated to be an effective treatment for bipolar disorder. Um, but treatment requires very close monitoring uh, of the individual, uh, in their health, uh, making sure that their lithium levels are within a specified range and that their kidneys are not um, are functioning normally. Uh, so, but it's the gold standard for treating bipolar disorder. So we compare everything else to whether it's as effective as lithium or not. In terms of its pharmacokinetics, peak blood levels are reached within three hours of oral administration. We get complete absorption by eight hours. Uh, its therapeutic e efficacy is directly related to plasma levels. Um, so levels are lower in the brain, we can uh, compare that to uh, directly to plasma levels. Uh, lithium is not metabolized, rather it's excreted unchanged by the kidneys and some of it gets sweat out, uh, but primarily it goes through the kidneys completely unchanged. Steady state is reached within about two weeks um, in most individuals, and so uh, that's the treatment goal is to get to those two weeks and see where we're at and see how the treatment is progressing. As I've said, there is a very narrow therapeutic range that has to be verified by blood levels. And so one of the issues is titrating that range for each individual, depending on their uh, level of activity, how much water they drink. I mean, all those sorts of things that go along with flushing a salt out of your body um, will have a lot to do with uh, maintaining that lithium level. So this can be very difficult. To maintain. So below 0.6 is the... Uh, ineffective range above 2.0 is toxic, so we, we don't have a lot uh, of range to work with. And so keeping it in that narrow range is often very difficult. So in terms of the ph pharmacodynamics, uh, there's no psychotropic effects in healthy patients. It seems to be similar to major depressive disorder. Lithium likely affects an intracellular process. Um, 
It appears to have a neuroprotective effect and possible neurotrophic effect. Again, only in individuals who have major depressive, or sorry, bipolar disorder. We do know that untreated bipolar disorder is associated with decreased cerebral gray matter volume. And so one of the goals is to stop that gray matter volume loss and um, try to if possibly uh, reverse some of that loss. That gets us then to the side effects and toxicity. And this is the problem with lithium. Disruptions in memory and cognition um, are a problem. And this is the side effect that is most related to noncompliance. Memory and concentrating. And obviously, if you're a professional who requires those two things, that's going to be very difficult. The risks for side effects are very high. Anything decreasing kidney function will affect lithium levels. So if your kidneys slow down, uh, then your lithium levels will go up. We have reduced renal clearance or organic brain disorder, vomiting or diarrhea, taking diuretics, caffeine, um, low sodium intake, high sodium excretion. Um, any of these things can potentially affect lithium levels. So if you're somebody like me who sweats a lot, it may be difficult to maintain those lithium levels during the summer, but more uh, not as difficult in the winter. It really just depends um, on the individual. So this is a pretty difficult drug to titrate. Some of the issues in lithium treatment, the first, uh, lithium is a teratogen, uh, that is it will cause or can uh, clearly cause birth defects. It's not advised for use during pregnancy. Other drugs should be considered. Other side effects result in significant non-compliance and that's of course an important issue. It's most effective when it's combined with an anti-epileptic or an antipsychotic, particularly for severe episodes. So we want to keep that in mind if this drug is being considered. So the lithium treatment moderate dose use study or the litmus study asked does combining lithium with other mood stabilizers or second generation antipsychotics result in greater benefit? They concluded there was no difference between groups and measures of change in psychiatric symptoms, but lithium add-on permitted less exposure to second generation antipsychotics and their accompanying side effects. So the lower doses of those second Products were allowed with that lithium add-on, but lithium is a difficult drug to be on and a difficult drug to stay on. All right, well that's a quick introduction to bipolar disorder and treatment with lithium. In the next lecture, we'll talk about uh, other drugs used to treat this particular disorder.